One of the most awe-inspiring moments from the new Bleach anime takes place at the beginning of Episode 7. We are given a real treat as Bleach fans here, where we see the original war 1,000 years ago between Yuha's army of Quincy's, the Leaked Reich, and the original Gote 13 in all of their bloodthirsty glory. Headed up by Yamamoto in his prime, we see all of them absolutely massacre this army of Quincy's by the thousands, all culminating as the cherry on the sundae of Yamamoto himself, clad in his bankai, walking over a smoldering mountain of Quincy corpses, crushing their skulls as he goes. Shojiro, his right-hand man, stabs Yuha in the back, and with a mighty yell, Yamamoto brings down his Zanpakuto and completely immolates Yuha on the spot into nothing but smoldering ash. Such is the fate of all those who oppose the greatest fighting force that the Seirete has ever known, the original Gote 13. Now, unfortunately, in this cold opener, we only get to see very brief flashes of these individual members of the Gote 13, who we did not know anything about beforehand. Also, they're all shrouded in silhouette for the most part. But that's okay, because Kubo follows this up with an absolutely stunning and marvelous color page spread, depicting all original 13 members of the Gote in full view, no silhouettes. We see their Zompok toe designs, as well as their outfits. We also get to see how their names are written a little later. Kubo releases that and the kanji for it, and we're going to be looking at all of that stuff today. Also, for whatever reason, like three of them wore glasses. That was something else I noticed in the silhouette. Uh, so yeah, just take that for whatever you will. About a quarter of the original Gote 13's fighting force were either far-sighted or near-sighted enough to require glasses. But honestly, I think that just goes back to Kubo really liking designing outfits and, you know, eyewear for his characters to wear. So like, you know, of course, Renji has his really cool visors and his like shades and everything like that. Aizen, of course, had his cool glasses. So uh, yeah, yeah, I think just Kubo really likes that design. So, yeah, we're going to be taking a look at the original Gote 13 today. Now, aside from what we saw in the episode, as well as the color spread, we don't really know much more about them beyond that. Um, however, Kubo was very nice, and he gave us their full names, and he also provided the kanji for how they're written, and that's going to be useful, at least, into looking into a little bit more into their personalities. Now, from what I've discovered over the years, because sometimes mangaka will be very on the nose with the name of a character. Like, for example, if a character has lightning abilities, they might have the kanji for lightning in their first name. It's just like, well, okay, that's pretty obvious, right? Uh, Kubo doesn't do that all too much if you look at the way that a lot of the characters' names are written. Um, like, for example, Renji's name does not have the kanji for, like, snake or baboon in it or anything like that. Um, Toshiro's name has has the kanji for Fuyu for winter, I think. So, kind of. I think Shunsui's first name, Shunsui has the name uh, as the kanji for springtime, uh, Haru in there. So, it's like, okay, kind of a little bit. But it's not on the nose. So, when I read off the kanji and what they individually mean for these characters, don't think it, because one of them has the uh, the kanji for Ame, um, rain, in their names, okay? That does not necessarily mean that their Zanpakuto is like, oh, it must, it must summon water, you know? It must be because he has the kanji for rain in his name. It, it, that must be where uh, Kubo is going with it here. Uh, we don't really know anything about, beyond uh, their appearances and the fact that, as Yuha said during the Thousand Year Blood War arc, um, they were all pretty much just mercenaries and bloodthirsty killers that were given, like, this fancy job, okay? Um, and we see that. Oh, totally do we see that in the cold opener for Episode 7. That, by the way, I love that. That was the last thing. I think it was, like, slightly before that episode aired. Um, it was revealed that color spread of the original Gote, and I remember looking at that and being like, wow, that's really cool. You know, Kubo designed all of these original Gote characters. That's neat. I was not expecting in the very next episode for all of them to be there. We actually get to see them just going ham on the Quincy's, okay? And uh, going off of what Yuha said, remember, um, yeah, the original Gote were pretty much just a group of killers that were rounded up by Yamamoto. Yamamoto was the strongest amongst them. It was really a might 
right makes right kind of mentality. Uh, and he was essentially like, okay, I'm getting, a, I'm getting a group together, okay? And they got really fancy outfits with the Captain Hayoris and everything and the fancy She-Hawk shows. Uh, and they could have little tassels and little, little trinkets that they added to their outfits to make them all look unique. Um, and over the years, over the next millennia, the Gote 13 would become this extremely honorable organization, okay, um, with things that they wish to protect, as in the Seirete. Also, keep in mind, the Seirete was around long before the Gote existed, okay? And this was something that was clarified in the Can't Fear Your Own World novels, but also was hinted at when uh, Ichigo and Renji went to go to Kirio's palace. Kirio mentioned that um, the history of the Soul Society is the history, it's almost like a million years of history there. And it goes back to the, uh, I guess, the creation of the Soul King, or rather, a better way to put that is the situation of le what led the Soul King to be in his current state, uh, frozen in the crystal as we see him in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, uh, when Yuha attacks the palace and everything like that. Like, what led to the Soul King being in that state, um, but the Soul Society and the Seirete at large existed many, many tens of hundreds of millennia before the Gote were formed, and the Gote were literally just this motley crew gathered together by Yamamoto that wore fancy outfits and pretty much just defended the Seirete with an iron fist. Um, it also kind of reminds me a little bit because I believe the samurai class in Japan, when they originated, they were pretty much just hired mercenaries. They were the soldiers of the daimyo and of the, like, the shogun and, like, the higher nobility in Japan. Uh, it wasn't until a little bit later that they became, like, poets and, like, oh, we're very deep thinkers and philosophers. It's something that goes, like, oh, from this wartime culture to peacetime culture was the evolution of the samurai and much in the same way with the Gotei 13. Uh, also, the original, like, Gotei 13, and when it comes to the divisions, I don't even know if they really had foot soldiers back then because we saw the original Gote 13 as Yuha said them were just like they, that, that was all they were they were 13 mercenaries 13 killers that was it okay which is also a really cool name for a movie 13 killers I wonder if like Okay, I know it's like an, another cultural thing. Uh, the number 13 is in American, like, English culture. It's like bad luck. I don't know if it has the same meaning in uh, Eastern cultures in, like, Japan. Uh, but the fact that, you know, the Gote 13 and in the original iteration of that, they were these brutal killers. Maybe the number 13 being unlucky. Maybe there's some connection to that. I, I, I don't really know. Um, but yeah, there were no foot soldiers or anything. And each of the individual captains did not really like... Like, the 4th Division is not the healing and support division yet. The 12th division is not the R&D department yet. The 9th division is not the head of the Seirete News Bulletin yet, okay? That doesn't exist. They're all just murderers, okay? So, um, I guess let's just start off with the easiest one. Oh, before I get into this also, um, thanks to Ryu for, uh, drawing four of the members of the original Gote. I commissioned artwork from Ryu for the thumbnail, and also we'll get to the members when we get there. Um, so thank him for that. He did fantastic work there. There. But let's start off with, of course, the man of the hour, the star of the show. Without any, without him, none of this would have been possible. Yamamoto Genryusai Shigekune. All right, he is here. He is in his prime. He has a mighty mustache, if there ever was one, and he has the strongest zanpakuto of all zanpaktos, unless you read like, you know, the expanded universe or whatever. But okay, Ryujin Jakaz, nothing to sneeze at. Okay, so uh, yeah, I can imagine back in his younger years uh, before he started founding the dojo and before like Chojuro's backstory and everything you know he was just out there in the wilds of the Rukon district just slicing people apart not unlike a certain Kempachi that we'll get acquainted to much much later um, and so he forms a team together his little outlaw team of thugs and um, I guess they just basically got so strong they were essentially like okay we're basically a fighting force now uh, maybe the soul king got in involved in this, maybe the Zero Squad got involved in this, maybe Ichibe back in the day, something or someone gave them the sort of like, okay, how about instead of just going around murdering everybody, how about we task you to protect the Seireite and we'll give you fancy outfits, okay? I'm not really sure exactly how this went down. We already know a lot about Yamamoto, I'm not going to stay too long on Yamamoto as well as Unohana, we know a lot about her as well. Uh, those are the only two original members of the Gote that were still members of the Gote at the start of Bleach, you know, when the Soul Society 
the arc happens. We have Yamamoto, still the head captain of Squad 1, and uh, Unohana, who is no longer the captain of Squad 11, but moved to the captain of Squad 4. And the nature of Squad 4, as we're going to get to, very different from how it was back then, okay? Uh, but yes, Yamamoto and his uh, Zanpakuto Ryujin Jaka, and by extension his Bankai Zankunotachi, was essentially a force to be absolutely feared. Um, Yamamoto, when he went up against Yuha, uh, th there was just a level of no mercy involved here. And it's a little bit of a flip. Um, not exactly, but the way that their fight happened later, and the stuff that Yuha says, and then the way that Yamamoto talks about him, and the way that Yuha views his, his own men, seems to imply that back then, a thousand years ago, Yamamoto was the callous one. He was the one that really didn't care too much about his colleagues and even the place he was protecting. It was more about not letting the leaked Reich invading their territory. This was their land that they claimed they're going to defend it, okay? Um, and then it was Yuha that was a little bit more about caring about his individual men, like, um, uh, like uh, not looters, uh, but uh, Zydritz and uh, Hubert, uh, um, you know, and, and they were kind of more like uh, that camaraderie there, okay? And then a thousand years later, when Yuha returns, it's flipped, where Yamamoto is the one that's now, after living for the most part a thousand years in peacetime, founds a dojo and teaches students in the way of the sword and has all of these generations of the Gote now, and he's still this pillar, this old man that stays there amongst all else to maintain the Seirete, to maintain the Soul Society's order. Okay, and he's into calligraphy and studying the arts and everything like that And he's just in his retirement for the most part You you still don't want to get Yamamoto angry as we saw in the thousand year blood work It's just that his personality his what he wants to protect has definitely changed over the course of a millennia Meanwhile Yuha basically spending a thousand years without a body or his mind and then eventually his power Is just ruminating on that just that revenge and it's just like I'm not going to make the same mistake twice. And we see that with Yuha, with the current um, existence of the Sternritter and the Vondenreich. Yuha, really, at the end of the day, cares not for his own men or soldiers, only what they can do for him. Uh, and that is shown more as we go throughout the Thousand Year Blood War arc, uh, the area that has not been animated yet. But nice little flip there between Yamamoto and Yuha and the way that Kubo really dealt with that kind of dichotomy. So uh, that, was, that was Yamamoto. But now, moving on to some of the newer captains or the older captains, you know what I mean. Uh, the second division captain was, of course, a member of the Shihoin clan. I was actually very surprised that the Shihoins were the only clan that from the very beginning were connected to their squad. I was expecting, uh, you know, a member of Squad 6 to be a representative of the Kuchki clan, because uh, Byakuya's father, Sojun Kuchki, was the lieutenant of Squad 6 before uh, you know, he was a member, as well as uh, uh, Ginrei Kuchki was the captain like a hundred years ago. But that was not the case. When it comes to the noble clan families that we're aware of, the only one that is a member is Shihoin Chika. Shihoin Chika is a young man with white hair, these cool-looking pendant earrings, and very noble attire underneath his Captain Hayori, as one would expect from most likely he was the clan head of the Shihoin during the time, you know, a thousand years ago during the fight with the Leaked Reich. Also, he has an interesting scarf. Remember, uh, Byakuya wears a scarf that's kind of indicative of noble families, like the heads of noble families will wear these interesting scarves and in the case with uh, Chika, he has this cool orange scarf as the head of the Shihoin. Uh, orange is sort of just the de facto color of their clan. Uh, at least Doroichi wears a lot of orange. Yushiro wears a lot of orange. Uh, Chika wears orange. So I guess orange is just the color of the Shihoins. Uh, makes sense. Uh, his Zanpakuto is really interesting. It has a gem inlay around the guard, so further indicating his noble regal status. Also, Chika being a member of the Shihoin clan definitely favors Hakuda or hand-to-hand -hand combat combat in his style of fighting. We see this during episode 7 where he just kicks one of the members of the Leak Rite's head clean off with how powerful he is. So, gives you an idea of how he probably prefers to fight. His name, Chika, has the kanji for thousand and the kanji for uh, day or sun. Uh, now, like I said, just because his name has, like, for example, one, one way you could read his name is 1,000 suns. Um, that does not mean that he has, like, his Zanpakuto is some kind of sun-based fire, uh, light, or, uh, you know, nuclear-powered ability. I mean, I guess it could be, you know, a thousand suns, his sword could have, like, a light power or something that would be neat, um, but that's not, you know, necessarily just because that's in 
in his name. He has the kanji for sun or day. Uh, does not mean he has that power. Um, now, there's really not a lot of other stuff to go off of here, but considering he is a member of the Shihoin clan, I have a few more things to say about Shika specifically. So, um, before I really understood about, like, what happened with the Soul King, I originally assumed that, yeah, okay, so we might have all five original founding members of the noble clans in the original Gote. That was not the case. The origin of the five noble clans stretches back long before this and actually coincides with the creation of the Soul King in his current state, as well as the Seirete and the Soul Society kind of in general. That's kind of how far back those noble clans exist. You know, like, not just a few thousand years, but, you know, like, almost a million years. It's a long time ago, right? So... We go back that far, uh, and by the time that the Gote is founded, we don't see a representative of the Kuchki clan yet. We don't see a representative of, I think it's the Suna Yashiro clan. Uh, that's the one that, like, Tokonato was part of in the Can't For Your Own World novel. Uh, I think there's one more of the noble clans that we don't know anything about, and uh, the Shiba clan as well. The Shiba clan was removed from Grace earlier, I mean later, but it's, you know, the uh, five great noble clans, and now it's just four of them. And, uh, in fact, there's another member of the original Gote, and we'll get to him when we get to him, um, but I actually thought he was a dead ringer for like one of the members of the Shiba clan and he actually was not. So yeah, uh, Shihoin Chika is the only representative from one of the noble clans in the original Gote 13. Next up, we have the original captain of the 3rd Division, Kinroku Izuhara. This is the dude that originally gave me the vibes of, like, a salary man. You know, he's got the glasses, and he just has this very neat and tidy hair, and he doesn't really seem like a guy that's really all that dangerous. He really seems like the kind of dude that would be like, uh, he would be like the president of a bank or something, right? Like, you could see going into this guy's office to ask for a promotion, and he's just there, just writing a memo, and he's like, Yes? Uh, hello there, sir, uh, Mr. Izuhara, sir, uh, I was wondering if I could get a raise. No. Okay, sir, thank you, sir, bye. And then he would just, like, walk out, right? So, uh, this is a dude, we actually see a little bit of his Zanpakuto in its sealed form. It's a Wakazashi, or, like, a, so a short sword. Uh, and we see him just walking up to a member of the leaked right, and just slitting their throat. Okay, so, literally, this is a dude, he's all business. Uh, I really get the impression from Izuhara. Uh, it's like, yes, we shall now go exterminate the Quincy's. And uh, we should hurry up because I have a dinner appointment this evening. You know, he's that kind of guy. And when battle starts, he doesn't rush in. He doesn't charge in like Unahana and just split one of the members of the league right in half. No, Izuhara just probably calmly walks into the battlefield, unsheaths his Zanpakuto, and it just goes like, you know, one at a time. Just like slice their throat, slice their throat. Very, very pragmatic, very efficient kind of murderer, <laughs> you know, that was Izuhara, right? As for his name, and by the way, I've been calling him Izuhara, that's his last name, okay, because I wrote them down uh, unfortunately, because like, first name, last name in the US is how we do it, and then of course, in Japan they reverse first and last name, so I should have flipped them, but whatever. So Izuhara is his family name, Kinroku is his given name, alright? And the kanji for that, Kin, is for gold, that was one that I knew already, so the kanji's for gold, as well as the kanji for halter and a bit which is a uh, term for, like, horseback riding. So horses will have a halter in a bit. It's the thing that goes over a horse's face. So, uh, golden horse halter. Uh, his Zanpakuto ability is he summons a golden horse! Let's just go super literal with this. Why not, right? Okay. But anyway, yeah, that's uh, the Division 3 original captain, Kinroku Izuhara. Next up, we have the 4th Division Captain, Shijima Chigiri. And I did say it correctly that time, so Shijima would be his family name, and Chigiri would be his first name, okay? So, uh, this man seems like, uh, not really much note, honestly. He, he looks kind of tired, looks kind of worn out, just looks like he's had a day, you know? He's just like... Ah, uh, guys, I really don't want to fight the Quincy's today. Can I just go and take a nap? You guys are all here. You got, like, 12 of you guys can handle this. I don't need to be here right now, right? Um, actually, in the episode, I think the scene with Chigiri that we see is this one right here. I believe this is him. Keep in mind, they're all in silhouette, where he's just not even really attacking the Quincy's. He's just kind of bathing in their blood, just kind of like... Oh, man, I got blood all over my outfit. Oh, man, it's going to be all day with this, guys. So, um, yeah, he doesn't look like somebody that would you would really want to bring into a battle, but make no mistake, as all of the original members of the Gote 13 were bloodthirsty killers through and through, Chigiri is no exception. His name, Chigiri, translates to uh, wisdom and the kanji for mist. 
So, Wisdom missed. So, ooh, missed. There's a Zompocto. I mean, they might have, I mean, connections. Who knows? So, his Zompocto is knowledge missed. Ooh, clearly, yes. Um, okay. Next up, we have the original captain of Squad 5. We have Obana Danjiro. And uh, this is the guy I thought that was going to be dollars for donuts, a member of the Shiba clan. Just look at him. He looks like a dude that's a member of the Shiba clan. He looks like a guy that would be related to Ishin, Kukaku, Ganju, Kayan, even Ichigo a little bit, right? I think he looks like Ishin more than anything. But um, yeah, maybe it's just because of Kubo's art style. You know, just looks like Ishin. That's just how it goes. But no, he's a member of the Obana family. Uh, Danjiro, I think, has the coolest outfit, or one of the coolest outfits out of all of the original members of the Gote. He's got these cool blue armbands. Blue is my favorite color. The, uh, the hilt of his Zanpakuto is also colored blue. He has this cool ponytail, a little bit of scruff here. Um, when he was fighting against the Quincy's in the episode, he didn't really do anything unique in terms of his fighting style. He just kind of took out a sword and just was just slicing through them. You know, nothing special there. But he seems like one of the members of the Gote that you could actually kind of get along with. He's like the most amenable out of all of them. Uh, you can see this guy kind of hanging out at the bar. You know, after all of the Quincy's were exterminated, all of the original Gote 13 members get together at a bar and, um, uh, Danjiro is the dude that'd be like, oh, hey, Yamamoto, you know, pop a seat right next to me. Here, have a brewski on me. Glug, 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 you know. Um, that, that seems like the kind of guy he is. We see him laughing in the artwork that, uh, Kubo drew of him. Um, so, yeah, he seems like a good-natured kind of fellow, uh, and, um, yeah, I, I just really like his design. In terms of his name, Danjiro uh, has the kanji for bullet and the kanji for child, as well as the counter for uh, different sons. In Japanese, you have these counters that are used, like, for example, in Sen Bone Zakura, Thousand Cherry Blossoms. Uh, bone, or hone, is the uh, counter for thin, sharp objects, which would be the razor blades of Sen Bone Zakura. So, Sen meaning a thousand, bone, as in hone, the counter for, you know, thin objects, and then Zakura. Zakura, as in Cherry Blossom, Sen Bone Zakura. So in the case with Danjiro's name, it's the kanji for bullet, the kanji for child, and then the counter for the number of sons that a family has. Okay, so there's that. Um, moving on next to another fan favorite, and this is another one I had Ryu commission the artwork for. We have the original captain of the 6th Division, who is not a Kuchki, but is Saito Furofushi. And, uh, yeah, looks remarkably like Riruka Dokugamine with an eye patch uh, as a member of Execution as a full bringer. I mean, once again, you could just say Kubo's style is similar here, but these two characters look almost like twins. Like, you could say Furofushi is Riruka's mom or grandmother, and I would buy it a hundred percent, okay? And what's what's even more interesting about her is her her first name, Furofushi, and the kanji that make that up, okay? So, um, you may notice that uh, Fu shows up twice in her first name, Furofushi, okay? So, Fu, in this instance, uses the kanji as a uh, negative particle, uh, basically Basically, the equivalent in English would be non. So, like, in English, the word uh, non-sequitur or non-binding uh, means, like, the negative of that word, okay? Not a sequitur, not binding, okay? So, that means that the kanji that comes after that is in the negative, so just keep that in mind. So, we have a negative particle, and then furo. So, ro, in this instance, uses the kanji for um, old age, and then she, as many people would probably know, is the kanji for death, okay? So literally translating her name, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not really all that good at, like, interpreting the Japanese language, so there might be another way of looking at this that I'm just not a, an expert in, okay? But just looking at it straight away from the order of the kanji, her first name would be non-aging and non-dying, which is interesting to me because it, it sounds um, a little arrogant, you know, just out of the gate, like, I am never dying and never aging, you know? But also, kind of, like, gives an idea for maybe, like, this is the one out of all of them. Like, if this tied into her Zompok Toe power, her Shikai or Bonkai in some way, I could see that. I could totally see some kind of, like, immortality ability, like, while she activates her Bonkai for, like, a period of certain number of minutes, she's, like, indestructible. Or, uh, maybe some kind of reincarnation ability, and I bring this up... Because Riruka. I mean, once again, they look exactly the same. Put an eye patch on Riruka, she looks like Furofushi, okay? So, maybe her ability has something to do with reincarnation. 
And, you know, that's all, already a theme in Bleach, like the whole Buddhist cycle of Samsara. That's already a thing. So if you want to say that Riruka, by some mechanism, is the reincarnated uh, Furofushi Saito... I'm okay with that. <laughs> like, I'm okay with that 100%. Uh, her Zanpakuto looks really cool. It has, like, a six-pointed star on it. And during the battle, we saw her just dive headlong in. I mean, she's sticking her tongue out. She's just like, ah, yes, I love the battle! <laughs> You know, and just shredding the Quincy's. Okay, so definitely a fan favorite. Definitely a lot of people were focusing on Furofushi. Um, next up, we have the captain of Squad 7, another notable man that I also had Ryu do the commission for. We have Shigyo Nobusuna. And, uh, yeah, this dude probably has the most, him and the captain of Squad 12 probably have the most elaborate outfits here. Uh, because Nobusuna, dude, I mean, look at this guy, right? I mean, honestly, I thought this dude could have been, like, he might have been the second Kampachi. Who knows? Like, Unahana decided to quit, and then, like, okay, Nobusuna, you obviously look like a Kampachi. You can join. But they kind of were all Kampachis back at the day. Not really, but they kind of were, you know what I mean? But yeah, just look at this dude. He has very gaunt, very sunken-in features. His skin is like this sickly gray color. Uh, the upper half of his face is like purple in one of the designs for Kubo, whether that's like a scar or a tattoo or some other kind of like birthmark or something. Uh, he has like these marks underneath his eyes. Um, he just looks like... If you were going to pick any of the Gotei 13 to, like, visually represent a god of death, a Shinigami, like the Grim Reaper... I'd be picking this dude, just in terms of appearance, okay? He also probably has the coolest uh, looking design for a Zanpakuto out of the original Gotei, and I think that's just because he's in the foreground of this color spread, him and uh, Furo, Fush uh, Furo Fushi are, and so you get to see their Zanpaktos in the foreground at, in the most detail. So he has this really cool Zanpakuto that has like all these different like spikes and kind of like arrows and stuff uh, pointing out of it. That's really cool. Uh, during the episode, once again, along with Danjiro, we only kind of saw him like cutting through these swaths of, of Quincy. We don't really see him focusing on anything in particular, but um, yeah, very intimidating looking dude. He's got these gloves. Uh, his name uh, translates to, let's see, we have the kanji for warrior, military, chivalry, and we also have uh, the kanji for rope. Uh, not just a regular rope, though. It's actually a hauser, which is like a mooring rope, like a rope that you would use to moor like a ship into the dock. So it's that type of rope. So warrior, chivalry, rope, Rope. Um, that's that's the kanji in his uh, his first name there. But uh, very intimidating kind of figure. Uh, you can tell Kubo put like a lot of detail into like what this dude was going to look like. I kind of want to see. I, I kind of want to know this guy's backstory. Uh, I mean, I kind of want to know all their backstories. But this dude, just his facial features, really tell a story in and of themselves. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, totally. Next up, we have the original captain of Squad Eight, Katori Batsu Unsai. Um, who? Okay, I'll just. She's my favorite, for reasons that are not obvious, but she is my favorite. She has really big, um, glasses. I mean, look at the glasses. The glasses are really cool. Also, by the way, you know, that, that is not a joke, okay? Seriously, when we have that original lineup of the Gote, when Yuha's marching his army into the Seirete, and you see that really cool lineup of all of the original Gote 13 members, and you just see this petite woman there with these giant glasses who looks like a librarian and it's like holy crap she is one of the strongest shinigami to ever live period and she takes out her zanpakuto one of the few that we actually do get to see in uh her shikai which is a naganata we do not know the name of it but i believe it's only her and actually the next captain of squad nine we actually do get to see their shikais we obviously already know about yamamoto and unohana's shikais and bankais uh individually there uh but i don't think any of the other other ones, with, with the possible exception of Squad 10's captain, and we'll get to him. Uh, but yeah, so her Zanpakuto Shikai is a Naganata, and she uses that to just spear and just slice these Quincy's head, like, in half, uh, while we see her fighting there, okay? Um, but yeah, uh, she bears a striking resemblance to Nanao, as well as Lisa. I thought she might have been a representative of the Issei clan, which is not a noble clan. Well, it is kind of, it's a, um, it's a clan that's like a, it's like an ecclesiastical clan. It's like a religious kind of, like, um, uh, monk 
monk, not monks, but like, um, you know, priestesses. That's what it is, like a priestess kind of clan. So I was thinking maybe she was a member of the Issei clan. But no, uh, Katori Batsu Unsai, her name, um, the kanji we have to extract or pilfer, like steal. Uh, also the kanji for cloud, kumo, and the kanji for um, purification, or a, uh, a, a it's, it's the specific term for this kanji is a uh, meal that is consumed by like a Buddhist monk, um, the food that they particularly would consume, okay, like in the temple, all right? So there are connections there to like a priestess's kind of Buddhist sort of idea. Also, I mean, this is a thousand years ago now. Keep in mind, Shinigami live a lot longer than humans, so I would assume a thousand years ago the Issei clan would already have existed, but maybe not. Maybe she was one of the uh, progenitors of the clan before it actually had its name. Who knows? Um, but that's uh, Batsu Unsai. She also has, okay, really huge. Okay, Captain of Squad 9, moving on. We have Kumoi and Tetsu. This guy's pretty badass, all right? We get to see his Shikai. And it's a Kanabo! Oh yeah, so I actually have that one on standby. Sorry, Rukia! But yeah, this dude, Kumoi, also extraordinarily intimidating. He's got like, and I'm not really sure what these are, if it's like a tattoo of teeth around his mouth, or if they're like a metal prosthetic, like actual metal, like like maybe piercings, like pinned into his face. Or hell, maybe he like ripped off part of his skin and his lips and we just see his freaking teeth. Uh, but he has like these golden teeth, he also wears glasses, and uh, he just goes and smashes Quincy's skulls wide open with a Kanabo Shikai. That's all you need right there. This dude is pretty damn intimidating. So Entetsu's name uh, literally just translates to smoke and fumes, and then we have the second kanji for Tetsu, which is iron. So smoky iron or iron fumes, something like that. Sounds like something that would be belonging in like some kind of refinery. Maybe that's the actual context of it. I don't really know. So uh, yeah, the, the iron part... I can kind of see, because he's swinging around a Kanabo, which, as you can see, is a Japanese club weapon that has these little, um, you know, protrusions out of them. Uh, sometimes I, I see them with spikes, like in One Piece, this is pretty obvious, like Kaido's Kanabo, Hasaikai, has spikes coming out of it. Meanwhile, Yamato's Kanabo uh, only has, like, these more blunt edges to it, and so um, uh, Entetsu uses uh, this kind of version right here. This is actually a pretty good, accurate summation, although his is made out of, like, a, like a dark blue kind of metal when he goes into his Shikai. It's not made out of wood, and it's obviously a Zanpakuto, so it's more sturdy than normal metal, but yeah, that's his uh, ability. Pretty, pretty cool looking. Next up, we have the original Captain of Squad 10, uh, and we have Otogawa Furuoki. Okay, and uh, this is the dude. I'm not really sure if we see his Shikai. Uh, in the color spread, he's kind of way in the background. We kind of only see his face. He has this uh, Kasa hat, this straw hat that he wears. Um, in the episode, though, we see him, and it might just be the perspective. I'm not really sure, but look at this image right here of... Um, Furuoki cutting down one of the Quincy's, and to me it looks like his Zanpakuto has like a distinctive hook shape, so maybe when he goes into his Shikai it takes the form of like a hooked base weapon, or once again it might just be the perspective messing with me, uh, but that's immediately what I saw, I thought of when I, I looked at him there, he had some kind of like hooked base weapon to like claw into the Quincy's um, he seems like out of all of them that we've seen so far, him and uh, Kinroku seem the most like level headed, you know, Kinroku being the salary man, dude. This this guy just looks like a standard kind of noble. Um, he looks like a prototype Byakuya, kind of. Just, like, very stoic, very, like, I like to sip tea in the afternoons and then work on my calligraphy in the evenings. You know, stuff like that. Um, and he's got the really cool hats. But, um, no, make no mistake, he'll cut you down just like all the other ones. Um, his kanji and his name, this is the one that has the kanji for Ame, or Rain, uh, as well as the kanji for uh, the beginning of something or the inception of something, and the kanji for Chronicle, or an account of something. So Rain, Inception, Account, Narrative could also mean. There it is. Okay, maybe he has a rain base on Pacto. November rain! Don't know. Next up, we have the original captain of Squad 11, the original Kenpachi, and somebody that we're very well acquainted with. We have Unohana Yachiru. Yachiru, of course, being her original name, not Retsu, which she adopts later. Uh, Yachiru uses the kanji for 8,000 and then styles, or methods of attacking. So 8,000 styles Yachiru, representing the number of styles that she has mastered. Also, because it, it implies she took that name, um, that might actually not be her original given name. In fact, no, because these are all kind of 
outlaws from the Rukon district. These might not be like their given names by like parents. They might be kind of like Kempachi Zaraki or kind of like Unahana, where she probably just like adopted the name uh, 8,000 Styles to represent her power and her prowess in battle and everything like that. So a lot of these other ones might have, you know, followed along in the same kind of style right there, right? They might have given themselves those names, which might indicate something connected to their Zanpakuto abilities. Who knows? Uh, but once again, not going to go very much into uh, Yachiru here. Uh, in the episode, she literally was the first one to dive into the battle as befitting of a Kempachi as the first Kenpachi literally dives right in and just bisects one of the Quincy's just just right in half just splits them head to freaking groin and uh, the battle is therefore on okay something interesting in the episode we see her a thousand years ago with her trademark scar uh, in her neck that um, you know Zaraki gave her when he was a child however I always um, I always took it to mean that that event happened a little later because when we get the backstory between Kenpachi Zaraki and Unohana it's mentioned that several hundred years ago is when she received that scar. The battle with the Quincy's was a thousand years ago, which means that she would have had to receive that scar over a thousand years ago. Um, also, just the idea that at that point when Unohana did fight Zoraki, uh, the, the first time that they fought, uh, it seemed to imply that Unohana was very bored with her life, um, just because there wasn't really a lot of enemies to fight. So I always took it to mean that this was well after the Quincy's invaded. That was like the last really good fight that they honestly had. And it's maybe like 700 years uh, before the start of the story. That's when she ran into Zaraki out in Rukon, and they fought, and uh, he delivered that scar onto her uh, neck. Um, so, I, I, I could be wrong. This could have happened before. I just wanted to point it out because it, it was something that kind of bugged me. Next up is the original captain of Squad 12, and, uh... All I can say about this dude is you can definitely see the inspiration that Mayori took. Uh, he he, he might have been... This is the dude that might have been Mayori's role model. Mayori might have looked at this guy and be like, Ah, yes! I want to model myself exactly after. Zen Joji Uhin. <laughs> so yeah, Uhin, uh, big, big dude. Uh, painted face, uh, white with, uh, red markings kind of all over it. He has the same red markings on his, like, wristbands as well as, like, a, uh, a tarp, like an apron that he wears over his Shihak show. And, uh... This guy's pretty brutal. Uh, I think he's the second person that gets into the battle right after Unohana. So Unohana kind of opens up the proceedings of the battle with the Leak Trike by bisecting one of the freaking Quincy's with one sword swing. Uhin is immediately after that, grabs two random Quincy's and just BOOM! Just smashes their heads together and they're just they're just puddles of jello just on the ground after that. I mean, it's he literally bashes their heads together and just like crushes them more. Just like, oh yeah! You know, <laughs> you guys asked for this you know it's on now all right this guy's like a professional wrestler oh my god he's very intimidating and yeah with the this is well before the time of the research and development division well before the time of Kiryo Hikefune and Mayori and Urahara and everybody like that so I don't think this guy was really all into science all too much um you know more just the science of of head bashing essentially um but the fact that his design you could see him as an inspiration for Mayori you know or Mayori takes inspiration from this dude I guess so maybe maybe Mayori, while he was in the uh, the maggot's nest, maybe he was reading up on the history of of the Gote or whatever, and he sees this dude, and he's just like, I'm gonna model my entire like aesthetic after this guy or or something like that. Um, he's like, ah, oh, yes, he is a man that's truly worthy of respect in his head bashing ways, <laughs> you know? Okay. Uhin's kanji that make up his name is uh, for possession or uh, existence, like owning something or owning a possession, I guess. Uh, and then another one is bride or marriage as the kanji that make it up. So I'm not really sure what that connects back to there, but that's his name. So anyway, yeah, uh, that's Uhin. Uh, definitely one of the more interesting looking members. And then finally, okay, so in terms of design, I really liked Danjiro. Uh, I really liked uh, Nobosuna and Uhin. In terms of my favorite, probably Batsu Unsai. Uh, seeing a member of the Shihoing clan was really cool. Uh, Furofushi looked really neat. Um, but out of all of them, the one that I am probably the most interested in, at least in knowing the story behind, is the final captain of the, the original captain of Squad 13, Sakahone Saizo. This old curmudgeon, doddering old man, one of the strongest Shinigami of all time, one of the most brutal old men of all time. So, Shinigami age, like, Yamamoto is well over a thousand years old, and he looks like a very old man. Now, he stays in shape. He's buff. 
Keep in mind, Unohana's the same age. She just aged way better. Probably because she's also a member. She's a, a, a healing squad, and also she has Kaido. She has healing Kido and stuff like that. But you look at Saizo, and this dude looks like he's about to keel over. This dude looks like, in human standards, about 150 years old. Like, this is the kind of guy you can look at that was probably born sometime in the 1800s. Like, this dude is missing teeth, he's bald, he's all wrinkly, his face is, like, mostly wrinkles, you can't even really make out his facial features, and he's hunched, as this very prominent hunchback, and he's just walking around, <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's just like, this guy is creepy as hell. I want to know the story behind this dude. This guy, you understand how old Shinigami live, and this guy is the oldest looking Shinigami out of all of them, bar none. Uh, Yamamoto, like when he got killed by Yuha, was probably like somewhere around 2,000 years old, maybe a little longer than that. When he was in his prime, that was about a thousand years ago when he fought against uh, Yuha, and he was like a young man, maybe like in his 40s by comparison to human years, okay? 40s or 50s. So if you want to say Yamamoto was maybe 2,000 years old, hell, maybe 3,000 years old. That's how old Yamamoto was. Saizo Sakahone, this guy looks like he'd be like 10,000 years old. This guy looks insanely decrepit, okay? Uh, which maybe, maybe it's a, a, an ability that he has, maybe going into his Shikai, maybe it's the kind of thing where he's like, he's an old man, but he goes into his Shikai or Bankai, and he gets, like, younger and buff, and he's just like, my youth has returned! So the kanji for Saizo, uh, his name means, uh, genius, and storehouse, or another way to look at it is to hide, to own something, to possess something. So yeah, I, I'm very interested, and, and during the battle, actually, it's very kind of funny, because uh, during when they were fighting the Quincy's, the scene that we get with Saizo is him just taking out his sword and just, like, there, it looks like somebody that's, like, already dead. Like, there's a Quincy that's, like, already laying down on the battlefield, like, dead or severely wounded, and Saizo just takes his Zanpakuto and just, like, <laughs> and just slowly, like, stabs it into his throat, okay? <laughs> you know? Um... I'm reading, I, I actually just finished reading a book by Joe Abercrombie uh, called um, The Blade Itself, all right? And it's a very good book. It's the first part of a trilogy, which th the, the name of the book is The Blade Itself, and it reminds me of uh, The Blade Is Me, which is a chapter in Bleach, right? Well, anyway, uh, no spoilers for the book, uh, but there's a character in the book um, named Glocktra, and he's like this decrepit old, not even decrepit, he's like in his 30s, but he's like this old mangled, debilitated man that is like, has a bad leg and he has to move around all of his teeth are knocked out and and he reminded me a lot of like this dude like i'm like oh, okay that's like very similar here so saizo and and he just like during the battlefield it gives us the impression that like he just walks up to a quincy and just <laughs> and just goes around and just stabs them like like we don't actually see him taking out his sword and like swinging it around or anything like that so i am very interested in this dude how old is he, and when did he get his Zanpakuto, and he might have been like, th do you understand, this dude might have been the original, this guy might have been Yamamoto's master, he might have taught Yamamoto and Unohana the ways of the sword when they were younger, just like Yamamoto taught Shunsui and Uketake. Yeah, this could have been Yamamoto's master, and then after Yamamoto grew up and, you know, joined and, you know, formed the Gote, he welcomed his old master on, Saizo, as, as a member of his, uh, of his team. Uh, it's interesting also because he's the 13th Division captain, and I find it, like, okay, the first captain of the, you know, Yamamoto, very prominent, and also the 13th captain also might be very prominent. Back in the Soul Society arc, Uketake was the last captain to be revealed, and we later see stuff with Ukitaki being very important. So I look at, like, Squad 1 and Squad 13, the beginning and the end of the Gote, very important positions uh, for different reasons. So I I'm looking at Saizo Sakahone, and I'm just like, man, there's a story there, and I would love to read about that. So, yeah, but anyway, those are the 13 original members of the Gote, of the Court Guard squads. Hope you guys enjoyed. This video took a little bit longer to get out, but uh, I had to wait for those uh, commissions. I wanted this video to be really perfect and just all put together. So thank you guys for watching. Uh, who is your favorite member of the Gote 13? Who, who is your favorite design-wise? Who is the most interesting to you based off of their appearance? And which ones do you want to see the Zanpakuto releases of? Um, I'll leave you with those three questions and like the most, or maybe they're all the same. Uh, for me, in terms of uh, actual appearance, like design, the way they look, that'll probably be a toss-up between Danjiro and Nobosuna. 
I'm gonna probably go with Donjiro. I just really love Donjiro's like the the, the blue and the um, the uh, arm guards and everything. His hair, his kind of like just boisterous kind of attitude. I like that guy. He's also Zanpakuto. Looks cool. Then, in terms of the most interesting, I would probably say uh, Saizo Sakahone. Definitely want to hear his story. And then, in terms of a uh, Zanpakuto, I would probably, I would honestly probably just go with uh, Batsu Usai there. Uh, just the Naginata looks really cool. So yeah. Uh, anyway, thanks for watching the video. I uh, hope you uh, liked it. So yeah, thank you. Points if you wear glasses. I don't. These were fake. But anyway, uh, later everybody. Teching signing out.